The Kabuki Desert sprawls across Inner Mongolia, China, 400 kilometers long, 50 kilometers wide, covering nearly 14,000 square kilometers of hostile terrain. For decades, this seventh largest desert in China served as a relentless enemy to human civilization. 61% of its landscape consisted of mobile sand dunes, some towering 60 meters high, forming massive chains and grid patterns that shifted with every gust of wind. But what made Kabuchi particularly dangerous wasn't just its size, it was its proximity to power. This desert sits closer to Beijing than any other major sand sea in China and during autumn and winter, its yellow storms would surge eastward, choking the capital in Tianjin in thick haze. Research documented over 30 sandstorms annually originating from this single location, making it the primary source of atmospheric pollution across northern China. Yet running along the desert's northern edge flows one of the world's great rivers, the Yellow River, 5,500 kilometers of water, carrying 58 billion cubic meters annually through nine provinces. This river, originating in the Bayanhar Mountains of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, presented both opportunity and threat. Each year, its freeze-thaw cycle lasted 120 days, and during flood season, rising waters threatened embankments with catastrophic failure. The Chinese government poured over 10 million yuan yearly into reinforcing riverbanks, a massive financial burden that still couldn't guarantee safety. Residents in the Hangjin Banner area lived caught between twin disasters, suffocating sandstorms from the desert and potential flooding from the river. Many abandoned their homes entirely. Then engineers proposed something audacious. What if the problem could become the solution? In 2004, China launched the Kubuki Desert Control Project with a $360 million investment, aiming to build something unprecedented, a 700-kilometer artificial canal system that would redirect Yellow River water directly into the desert's lowest points. The concept was elegant in its logic. During high water periods, when flood risk peaked, water would be channeled into Kabuki's depressions, simultaneously relieving pressure on embankments while irrigating barren sand. This wasn't simple water diversion. This was ecological engineering on a scale rarely attempted. Construction crews faced conditions that tested human endurance. Workers wielded basic tools in screaming winds, digging channels through shifting sand that could bury a day's progress overnight. Exploration teams ventured deep into the sand sea carrying heavy surveying equipment and survival supplies on their backs, mapping routes through an environment that wanted them gone. The real challenge emerged during pipeline installation. Steel pipes weighing multiple tons had to be transported across unstable quicksand, then hoisted and positioned with millimeter precision. One miscalculation meant deformation, collapse, or complete structural failure. The ground itself refused to cooperate. What seemed solid one moment became liquid the next. Water crossings added another layer of complexity. Where the canal needed to traverse natural waterways like the Yellow River itself, engineers couldn't simply blast through. Environmental protection demanded overhead bridges or elaborate detours, requiring sophisticated culvert and aqueduct designs that maintained water flow while preserving river ecology and hydrological balance. Each structure represented a mathematical puzzle solved under brutal conditions, where sandstorms could halt work for days and summer temperatures exceeded 40 degrees Celsius. Through determination and technical innovation, construction teams worked around the clock for years, eventually completing the network in 2014. The system became operational with capacity to inject 8 billion cubic meters of water annually into Kabuki's parched interior. But water alone wasn't the miracle. It was what the water carried. The Yellow River earned its name from its extraordinary sediment load. There's a popular saying that claims 7% of every bucket drawn from this river is actually mud. Thick, mineral-rich, yellow silt eroded from the Los Plateau upstream. This sediment, far from being waste, contains crucial minerals and organic compounds. More importantly, it possesses unique physical properties. 
When yellow river mud encounters water, it expands, forming a sticky colloidal gel that binds loose sand particles together. This natural cement transforms the fundamental structure of desert sand, converting individual grains into cohesive soil with dramatically improved water retention capacity. The organic matter within this sediment provides nutrients that barren sand completely lacks, creating conditions where plant life can establish roots. The transformation happened faster than anyone anticipated. By 2016, residents planted 5,200 acres of rice in former desert. Rice, a crop requiring consistent moisture and fertile soil. The success proved the land had fundamentally changed. Within one year, that number nearly doubled. By 2017, over 10,200 acres supported more than 100 different crop varieties. Grains, cash crops, fodder, trees, shrubs, and medicinal herbs. What was once lifeless sand had become productive agricultural land generating real economic value. Local herders recognized the opportunity immediately. Grasslands emerged naturally as vegetation took hold, and farmers integrated livestock operations into the evolving landscape. The organic combination of farmland, pasture, and water created a self-reinforcing agricultural ecosystem. Desert communities that once struggled for survival now generated wealth. Current annual economic output from Kabuchi agricultural activities exceeds $270,000 money flowing into communities that a generation earlier had nothing but sand and wind. The ecological statistics tell an extraordinary story of reversal. Vegetation coverage in Kubuki once measured below 1%. Today, approximately one-third of the entire desert area shows green cover. Tree planting survival rates exceed 80%, meaning saplings don't just get planted, they actually live, grow, and reproduce. Overall vegetation coverage now stands at 65%, representing a 30 percentage point increase in just one decade. The number of documented biological species has exploded to 1,026 compared to the handful that could survive before intervention. Mobile sand dunes, once the defining feature of this landscape, have been stabilized across millions of acres. Since 2015 alone, 490 million cubic meters of Yellow River water have been channeled into the desert, creating nearly 100 square kilometers of permanent water bodies and wetlands. These aren't temporary puddles that evaporate in summer heat. They're stable aquatic ecosystems supporting fish populations and aquatic plants. Over 8.4 million acres of desert have been brought under effective management. The landscape now displays an interconnected pattern of sand, water, and vegetation that functions as a genuine ecosystem rather than a dead zone. More than 20 plant species have naturally re-established themselves without human planting, proving the environment has recovered enough to support spontaneous ecological succession. Over 10 species of water birds now inhabit the region permanently, not as occasional migrants, but as year-round residents. These include species that had vanished from the area decades earlier, now returned because viable habitat exists again. The human response followed the ecological recovery. Tens of thousands of people have relocated from the deeper Gobi regions into these newly irrigated zones, drawn by the possibility of stable livelihoods. These migrants don't arrive as refugees. They come as farmers, herders, and entrepreneurs. Around their new settlements, they've planted millions of trees and established sand prevention shrub barriers, not because the government mandates it, but because protecting their investment makes economic sense. The ecological improvement creates agricultural opportunity, which generates wealth, which, in turn, funds further environmental protection. The cycle becomes self-sustaining. Kubuki's transformation didn't rely on a single technique. The Yellow River diversion formed the foundation, but, you know, success required layered strategies, converting farmland back to forest in vulnerable areas, enforcing grazing restrictions to prevent over-exploitation, constructing the Three North Shelterbelt system, 
a massive green wall stretching across northern China, and implementing three-dimensional ecological photovoltaic systems that generate solar power while providing shade for vegetation underneath. The Beijing Tianjin Sandstorm Source Control Project specifically targeted Kabuchi as a priority area, coordinating resources across multiple government agencies. This comprehensive approach addressed desertification from every angle simultaneously. It prevented new degradation while actively reversing existing damage. It combined engineering solutions with natural regeneration, modern technology with traditional ecological knowledge. Most critically, it made environmental restoration economically beneficial for local populations, ensuring long-term participation without requiring constant government subsidies or enforcement. The results extend beyond Kabuki's borders. Beijing's air quality has measurably improved as sandstorm frequency decreased. Agricultural output from Inner Mongolia has increased, strengthening food security. The biodiversity gains contribute to regional ecosystem stability across northern China. Water management improvements on the Yellow River reduce flood risk for millions of people living downstream. International attention has focused intensely on Kubuchi as a model for desert reclamation. The United Nations Environment Program recognized the project as a global example of successful land restoration. Delegations from countries facing similar desertification challenges, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Middle Eastern nations, and African countries bordering the Sahara have visited to study the techniques and strategies employed. What makes Kubuki particularly relevant as a model isn't just the engineering achievement, but the demonstration that large-scale environmental recovery is economically viable and can improve human welfare rather than requiring sacrifice. The physics and chemistry involved aren't magical or secret. The Yellow River's sediment load provides the binding agent and nutrients. Controlled water application prevents evaporation losses that would occur with surface flooding. The selection of plant species adapted to semi-arid conditions ensures survival without constant irrigation. The integration of economic activities gives local populations stake in maintaining improvements. These principles could be replicated elsewhere with appropriate adaptation to local conditions. Yet questions remain about long-term sustainability. The Yellow River's water supply isn't infinite and climate change affects precipitation patterns across China. If the river's flow decreases, can the canal system continue operating at current capacity? If sediment loads change, either increasing or decreasing, how will that affect soil formation in irrigated areas? The economic model depends partly on agricultural output, which remains vulnerable to market fluctuations and environmental shocks. Maintaining 700 kilometers of canal infrastructure through harsh desert conditions requires continuous investment and expertise. Despite these uncertainties, Kabuki demonstrates something profound about humanity's relationship with nature. Deserts aren't permanent features locked in unchangeable states. With sufficient knowledge, resources, and commitment, even severely degraded landscapes can be restored to productive ecosystems. The key lies not in fighting against natural processes, but in understanding and redirecting them. The Yellow River wanted to flood, Engineers gave it a place to go that served human needs. The sand wanted to hold water. Sediment provided the means to make that happen. Native plants wanted to grow. Creating the right soil conditions allowed them to return. Nine years of continuous water diversion have pumped 120 billion cubic meters into Kabuki. Enough water to fill Lake Superior twice over. That's not water wasted or lost but water transformed into vegetation, soil moisture, wetlands, and agricultural productivity. Every cubic meter represents potential, the potential for carbon sequestration as plants grow, for food production in former wasteland, for wildlife habitat where none existed, for human communities to thrive rather than merely survive. The sand dunes that once threatened Beijing still exist in parts of Kabuki, but they no longer advance unchecked. The Yellow River still floods seasonally, but its excess water now feeds life instead of destroying it. The desert remains a desert in name and in significant portions of its geography, but it's no longer a synonym for death and desolation. 
it has become something more complex, more interesting, and far more valuable. A managed ecosystem where human needs and natural processes achieve a working balance. This is the real achievement of Kabuchi, not the elimination of a desert, but its transformation into something that serves both ecological functions and human purposes. It proves that with careful planning and sustained effort, we can repair some of the damage our species has inflicted on the planet. It shows that environmental restoration and economic development need not be opposing goals. And it demonstrates that even the most hostile landscapes can be reconciled with human civilization when we choose to invest in solutions rather than simply manage disasters. The miracle isn't the water flowing through the desert. The miracle is what that water represents, the possibility of redemption for landscapes we once wrote off as beyond saving.